Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on addressing secondary trauma in tribal court staff. My name, as Jessica said, is Rebecca Horschief. I'm Osage from Oklahoma and I am the program coordinator for the National American Indian Court Judges Association. I'll be moderating today. We want this to be an interactive experience, so please feel free to ask questions throughout using the chat feature and answer the polls as they pop up throughout the webinar. I wanted to say initially, thank you for your time today, Judge Fairbanks. It's a busy season, and so we really appreciate you being available. With that, I will introduce Judge Fairbanks. Judge Cheryl Demert Fairbanks is Queen of Shimshen and was born in Ketchikan, Alaska. She works in the area of Indian law as an attorney and Tribal Court of Appeals Justice. Currently, she is the Interim Executive Director of the UNM Native American Budget and Policy Institute. She recently was in Oregon serving as the Walter R. Echohawk Distinguished Visiting Professor of Law at Lewis and Clark. And also, she was a visiting professor of law at the University of New Mexico's Southwest Indian Law Clinic. Formerly a partner at Cuddy McCarthy, she had a general practice in Indian law, including tribal state relations, personnel, tribal courts, peacemaking and family conferencing, mediation, family, school, education, and indigenous law. She's also worked as a senior policy analyst with the New Mexico Office of Indian Affairs in the area of state tribal relations. There, she was instrumental in establishing the Indian Child Welfare Desk, New Mexico Office of Indian Tourism, the University of New Mexico Indian Law Clinic, and the passage of the New Mexico Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So prior to her law career, she also served as a teacher for the Albuquerque Public Schools, Zia Day School, uh, was an administrator for Acomita Day School and the Albuquerque Santa Fe Indian School. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Judge Fairbanks. Thank you, Rebecca, and um, welcome to everyone. <clears throat> um, I see by the uh, chat we have quite an esteemed audience, and uh, welcome. Um, we're just so happy to have you on, and I hope you'll bear with me. I'm a little bit technically challenged, uh, so uh, let's begin. And so um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this in terms of how can we as um, uh, practitioners, either lawyers or uh, judges, um, how can we really um, develop an awareness of self-care? And so this has been um, a compilation of a lot of different uh, mentors I've had or advisors that I've had who, who've helped me try to um, uh, understand um, how important self-care is. And it's not just going to be self-care, it's going to be extreme self-care. So um, Rebecca and Jessica, are, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes, you sound great. OK, good, thanks. OK, so um, I gave a lot of thought about, um, especially as Indian law practitioners, we always talk about sovereignty. and. I love this sovereignty begins at home because I was with a group of tribal people and um, they were saying, oh, I thought sovereignty was just for the government or just for the council. And I thought, no, sovereignty is us. It, it uh, really begins at home. And so really think about that in terms of your own self-care. And um, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And I think if you'll just reflect on your own careers and your own daily, weekly, monthly schedule, um, you'll begin to say, wow, you know, that is a lot. And um, some of us, you know, as professionals, we have um, other responsibilities at home, cultural responsibilities with the tribe. And I found myself um, 
uh, just too maxed out for time. And, uh, and I really had to pivot and, and really shift to some different kinds of choices. And I really had to, to look at the truth in terms of my own schedule. So I'm hoping today that you'll really do some self-evaluation and really think about, you know, am I really being good to myself? Am I being gentle with myself? Am I really um, thinking about self-care? And um, so I wanted you to, to challenge you to shift toward a more therapeutic and a more balanced justice, especially in our careers and especially on the bench. Um, we're talking about wellness courts. We're talking about peacemaking courts. Um, we're talking about healing. And as practitioners, I think we really have to bring that home to us in terms of, of how are we doing? Because the cases that we're listening to or we're working on, they do take their toll on us. I remember um, one instance where I was working on an uh, Indian child welfare case, and I thought this, I spent a lot of time on it, and then the case kind of blew up in my face. And I was like, oh my god, I was sick. I was literally ill. Um, and so I had to really calm down and really take a good look at, um, you know, what is reasonable? What is, what is um, uh, not that it has to be perfect, but what can I live with in terms of an outcome? And, of course, um, we have a lot of impact on families and friends. Um, in, in our demeanor, and sometimes our patience is, is tested. Um, and so please pause to, to think about that, because hearing and the repeated hearing of cases over and over and over really begins to affect us in many ways, and sometimes um, results in just total burnout or what's called compassion fatigue, or we're impacted by this vicarious trauma. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean about that. Um, and so Jessica and Rebecca, will you let me know if there's a, a, a question? Yes. Yes, I'll absolutely. Okay, yes. okay. Um, so um, I looked at fatigue and vicarious trauma, and I found some statistics where 500 judges were surveyed, and just on the effect of the court calendar, and 105 judges responded, <clears throat> and out of that group, 63% said yes, they had work-related um, compassion fatigue. And so, um, the frequency and acuity of the system, that elevates when we're responsible for the lives of others. I know um, uh, our spouses, our significant others, probably have better data on that in terms of, um, of our impact on the family. And um, I think sometimes we may be suffering more symptoms, then we are really willing to, to uh, self-report. And I hope, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you. Um, one of the things that um, the literature said is uh, compassion fatigue seems to peak at the seven-year mark. And how many uh, judges on the line um, can relate to that. Are, do we have judges who are um, around the seven-year mark or under the seven-year mark? We have folks who are typing, Judge Fairbanks. Okay. And so um, I know there's many judges who are over the seven-year mark, like myself, and I see many of you on the line are way over the seven-year mark. But pay attention to that, um, because you can be 
begin to develop your own awareness um, because um, there are so many instances of the vicarious trauma and really um, that can result in triggers. And, and just the experience of witnessing um, things, atrocities committed against someone, absorbing that sight and sound, touch, feel, um, can result in an instant physical reaction. Did we get to figure out how many judges were under seven years? It says that uh, two of them indicated that they are right at the se one. Sarah works. Judge Sarah works is at the seven-year mark. Uh, Meredith, Judge Meredith Trent said yes, and um, John Pallas the third says five plus years. Um, Judge Trent says she's at six years. Good. Well, you know, um, I think we are uh, judges who have served for many years. We have an opportunity to really work with those new judges um, to really help them be more aware of the self-care that's necessary because of, of the effect um, and, and how responsible we have to be when we're on the bench. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And it's good to see so many of you that I know. Um, so what happens is it really disrupts your own beliefs, your own core values. Like I can think of my own core values that I've worked with as a lawyer and as a judge, and I would like to say, yeah, I'm there with those. But boom, you can go off of that so fast. And so you begin, um, the, as a judge or as a practitioner, you begin to um, doubt your own beliefs and about the safety and inherent kindness of others. I call that the jaded effect. <laughs> and so um, the compassion fatigue, if you look on the left, um, the professional, the, no, the notion of being burned out by the kind of work that you do, the kind of patients and families that you deal with, and the residue from ministering to those hurting people. And on the right, talks about the caregiver. And a lot of times, I think, as, as our judicial leadership, we have an um, opportunity to really affect the whole system in terms of the social workers, the practitioners before you. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, that's really sending the wrong message. So on the caregiver side, it's it is not about problems and hassles at work, but it is about the stress associated with the clients you deal with. Um, does that sound familiar? Um, practitioners work relentlessly uh, for their clients, and often we sacrifice our own health and our own private life to devote more time to our issues. And, um, we're passionately involved in our work, and often we're staying late at the office, or we're skipping lunch and or breaks in an effort to to really help clients. And I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but it was kind of good for me to um, have to do this because it's a constant um, awareness. Otherwise you begin backing yourself into a corner in terms of your health. And so again, compassion fatigue in judges, it is the result of vicariously becoming worn down and emotionally weary from hearing about and dealing with situations where people have been physically and emotionally injured, hospitalized, and all too often killed. I was visiting with a judge, and she was having um, issues with her teenager, and um, she um, decided to get her into um, counseling. And, uh, you know, being a good mother sounds reasonable, but then the counselor wanted to, to talk to her. 
And um, the judge was kind of uh, shocked, you know. Um, and the counselor was really upfront with her because she wasn't letting her child do anything. She was so afraid that her child was going to get hurt. Um, and she was so overreacting to everything she was heard on the bench day after day after day that she was kind of putting this unrealistic protective barrier around her child and not letting her child just live a normal uh, life for an adolescent. And so um, that was a message to the judge to be more aware of her own um, health and, and how she's dealing with all these cases. And so what are the symptoms? And um, some of the internalized systems are sleeplessness. How many of you have woke, uh, awake at 3 o'clock in the morning going, oh my god, I hope I placed that child in the safe home, safe, loving, nurturing home? Or did I make the right decision? Um, a case that's very complex um, and, and full of adversity, um, you know, begins to, to really affect your, your sleep. Um, others, eating disturbances, you know, you're rushing and you don't even know what you're eating. You're snacking on a bag of chips and off you go. So this really causes increased anxiety, depression, and often hypervigilance. And so some of the external symptoms, angry, irritable, intolerant, fearfulness, security consciousness, and I think that's what the judge I was explaining to you when she was working with her child was like fearful and was her child safe. Inability to make prompt decisions and increased difficulty focusing in, on concentration. And so um, the cumulative impact of long-term exposure um, to, this, to all of these um, things, um, like photos, um, uh, impact, victim impact statements, evidence, um, and uh, often issues that are happening within your court, really together have major impact. Um, and so uh, the issue becomes even stronger when we're responsible for um, the lives of others. You have some comments. I had that part. Sure, thanks. OK. Um, in terms of the years, uh, Judge Hager has, is at a seven-year mark. And Stacy Smith is at a five-year mark. We have a comment from Rena Totis. She says, as a court clerk, the clerks see and live more of the client's life, more than the judges see. I have worked for over 22 years. Um, you also have a comment from Mary Jo Hunter, who says, ironically, I'm in my office to address an issue that has come up. Sometimes there is not enough time to address matters that create trauma. And, and thank you. Was there another one? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that um, it, that the time management I find to be one of the biggest issues for me in terms of there's never enough time. You're always in a rush. And um, I don't know who the judge was who said that she's dealing with something right now. Um, that happens on a daily basis. And I'm hoping that as we go through the um, PowerPoint, that we can share some of these stories and then how do we address that? Um, and how do we take better care of ourselves? So rather than reacting, we're responding. And I always do a self-check on that. And a lot of times, I'm in reaction mode. That's my personality. <laughs> and I have to just really settle down and breathe. I do the three breathing um, 
uh, my little breathing exercise, and that's just breathe in. And let's just try it once right here. I know it seems kind of woo-wooey, but let's just breathe in and just follow me for just a few seconds, and I think you'll see the, the positive effect of it, okay? So quiet yourself. Stand in your own sacredness. See that protective circle, and there's a lot of power in the circle. But put yourself in the middle of that circle. Lower your shoulders. Don't have them up by your ears. Lower them, lower them, lower them. Okay, we're only going to do three breaths. So follow me. Breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. So you're going, you're blowing. Okay? You ready? Breathe in. Breathe in kindness. Hold. Breathe out. One more time. Breathe in, hold, breathe in peace, breathe out peace. Lower your shoulders one more time. Breathe in, breathe in magnificence. Breathe in, breathe out magnificence. Quiet yourself. Now stand in your own magnificence. And just quiet yourself there for just a few minutes. And so you have to get um, comfortable with that quietness, that silence. And the breathing is such a easy, easy thing. And I do it with my grandkids. I've done it with my law classes. At first they didn't want to do it, but once they did, and I do it with the peace circle, when I'm running a peace circle because emotions are running high, and it's just a nice way to really get the energy moving in a positive direction, and it gets you to a point of responding and not reacting, okay? Was there anything else we needed to do that, to address? I do not have any other comments. Okay, so um, thank you. And so one of the things that, um, when I was looking at the research, not too much was talked about um, the, um, historical trauma that often indigenous people have faced. And um, one of the things that um, I think that we ourselves as indigenous people often ignore. And so there's all kinds of trauma that we are impacted by. And um, I certainly yield to the counselors and the behavioral health people on this. But just as it relates to, to me as a tribal judge and um, practitioner, um, I looked at these federal policies and borrowed from uh, Dr. Maria um, Yellow Horse Braveheart. And um, all of those policies really have had an effect. And many, um, some of my colleagues have said, oh, that's history. Or I was presenting it here in New Mexico to some government leaders, and they were saying, well, that's history. Yeah, it's history, but I think it's important to point it out because we don't want to repeat that. And so um, uh, I really had to think about it because they were, they're failed, they're harsh failed uh, federal policies, state policies, and they really had a wounding and psychological effect, not just on individuals, but on generations. And, and, and so um, that has resulted in group trauma, as uh, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart has taught us. So that historical trauma combined with actual trauma and the vicarious trauma together 
the cumulative effect of that is something we really have to pay attention to. And it was Sandy um, Whitehawk, a, a colleague, you know, who really does phenomenal work throughout the country. Um, she was talking about this as an adoptee, and I was listening to her. Um, um, we were at Mississippi Banna Choctaw at their judicial ICWA conclave, and she said something, and oh my God, it just triggered me. And that's when I began to pay, because I had to go on next. And I thought, I can't be just sobbing. And, and so I really did have to pay a little more attention, not just to actual trauma or vicarious trauma, but to some of the historical trauma that has really impacted us. And what was triggering me was the boarding school um, issues. And, you know, I thank stories because that's where we get to the healing. And so we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, in the next couple slides. So all of this results in compassion fatigue. And I borrowed this because um, I just think it, it was so um, simple and I could get it. And uh, you know, here are some warning signs. Exhaustion, um, reduced ability and empathy, anger, irritabil uh, irritability, increased use of alcohol and drugs, dread of working with certain clients. Maybe it's just the dread of going to work. Um, disrupt, diminished sense of enjoyment of career, disruption of the world view. Um, and then on the right side, of course, it says danger. And um, so it's that anxiety and um, uh, difficulty in terms of separating your work from your personal life. Um, I, I know, especially as judges, I don't know if we ever stop to take the time to separate our work from our personal life. And of course, often there's absenteeism. And um, uh, so those are just some warning signs that um, you should pay attention to. And um, for me, I, I've had to really pay attention to it because I've ignored it for so many years. So the result really in, involves burnout plus a negative shift in your worldview. Um, so we're going to pause right now to think about your own day, your own week, your month and year. Reflect uh, on... Um, you know, any time you may have experienced um, historical trauma matters or vicarious trauma that has resulted in, in compassion fatigue, what did it look like? How did it, did it affect you? How did you manage it? What, and what might you do differently? Um, I remember um, uh, being at my mom's house, and I was just talking to someone about a really bad um, child abuse case that really involved a lot of um, violence and trauma, intergenerational issues, um, criminal as well as um, uh, family issues, tribal issues, political issues. And it was just like, um, oh, there was a rape involved. And my mother just looked at me like, how could you just be talking about it like that? And I thought, oh my goodness, you know. We become so jaded in our approach and so used to talking about things that are of, of real um, intense uh, uh, difficulty, um, and so we have to be careful. Um, so I wanted to pause and just ask if anyone, and I didn't, I guess I thought people could talk about it, but I'm going to kind of put, Jessica and Rebecca on the line to maybe 
could you share your experience or if there's a judge on the line that you could carry the message for? We, just a little bit before that, we had a comment from Terry Sue John who says that she just had uh, a DV training and it was explained that trauma is three generations deep. So her, our children feel that trauma is what she said. Thank you. Yeah, and I would appreciate um, you all weighing in on, on it. I know that um, when I look at the list of, of people, there are a lot of experts, and I, I would appreciate those kind of um, uh, adding to strength of the presentation. And, and I think often what I've noticed, especially within my own family and being on the bench, if you don't stop the cycle of all that historical trauma or trauma or issues, it, especially such as such um, issues as domestic violence or child abuse, if you don't stop that cycle, it seems like it exacerbates in the next generation. And so just stopping the cycle. And while I was in Oregon, um, it was a diff I, we had done a peacemaking session for the general community, and um, one of the uh, participants asked if she could have dinner. And I said, I was a little hesitant, um, but I said yes. And um, she explained her generational trauma in a way that I have never, ever heard before. And it was a very powerful story. And what and I was taken aback because I think sometimes we're only seeing the surface of it. We're not seeing the depth of how resilient these individuals are. And I think what came clear to me and what I was able to share with her, because it was such a powerful um, story, is you stop the cycle. And, and I think that's a simple phrase, but we have to stop that cycle. Uh, Judge Fairbanks, when you were um, asking for um, us to talk about experiences with folks we've talked about, uh, or we've talked to, I remember talking with a judge who was working in, um, in a healing to wellness court and she said she hadn't realized how close she was to that kind of danger line of vicarious trauma until she was on the bench and she just got so mad at this mother who was in front of her. Um, and she she kind of, you know, she sort of blew up. She, she kind of yelled and, and did a little bit of lecturing and she actually felt like she needed to apologize after the fact. But it was a little bit about this idea that you know this mother was putting her children in danger, and there, that there was just so much, and she had not been paying attention to her own trauma that she was experiencing, and she just she felt like that was her moment where she realized she needed to to always be monitoring herself for these things. Um, thank you, you for sharing that, yeah. Judge Fairbanks. You have a comment from Chief Judge Drent. Uh, she says, I've narrowed down the type of entertainment I seek to happy ending action films and comedies because everything else is just too real. Everyone talks about these really powerful movies about the human experience, and I'm like, no, Captain America for the ninth viewing. And Judge Works agrees 100%. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Rebecca, did you have any um, experience that you might want to share, or are there any other judges? There's uh, Rayanne Skinendor uh, with Oneida Judiciary says, uh, not just court judges, but court personnel and associated agency personnel. Recent incident here affecting agencies that use the court. And we have another uh, judge that's typing. Um, um, I thought, okay. So 
Yes, the, the court personnel is is um, it's so important that I'm thinking that um, we really need to, I, I know I'm working with the UNM Native American Budget and Policy Institute and we share space with um, New Mexico Law and Poverty. And so we really made a concerted effort to look at this together. And um, once we did, the whole staff was involved and it really made a big difference. It made a big difference in just um, respecting each other. Um, it made a big difference in the work environment. And, um, and I was going to ask, and I, I'm trying to read all this stuff and talk at the same time, but um, if someone could explain what, what it looked like and then how did it affect you and how did you manage it? And even if you managed it wrong, and what would you do differently? And I think that's the important piece um, because the judge who just said that she was lecturing from the bench, I remembered I did that with a really tough um, child sexual abuse case, and I was kind of upset with the mother. Well, I did not realize that the mother herself was a victim and neither did she until she um, she had blocked it out, until she began, began to deal with her own child's issues. And, you know, just trying to respond to all that and to move it forward, you know, um, uh, it really requires the whole team working together. Um, and so, um, Rebecca or Jessica, I'm going to have you uh, speak for some of the other judges, if you would, please. A few more comments, Judge Fairbanks. Um, Helen Poitra Chalmers, who's with Cadillac, says, also advocates and myself as a lawyer can have both a traumatizing and empowering experience through the relationship we have with clients. Rena Tota says, trauma brings steps that need to be processed. Grieving, hurting, and healing, these are family values that are passed down and learned. Living two worlds is hard. And you have two other uh, participants who are typing. Um, yes. Um, Rena, I could really relate to that because um, uh, often we're going back and forth, you know, um, and filtering all that, and it's exhaustive, really exhaustive. And um, uh, I think the one thing that I'm happy to be a part of through NIJA and through peacemaking and also partnershiping with the National Council and NARPS is we're able to move toward more healing, healing within systems. Um, when I was in law school, we never talked about the H word, you know, the healing. You know, we always talked about win and losing. So I think that we're at a time now when we can rethink our environment and how are we really effectuating change and how are we really transforming, um, helping transform others' lives and moving toward healing. And I borrow from my colleague, um, uh, Judge Patowski, as he works at his environment. And we don't pay enough attention to the environment. And that drives about 33% of, of effectiveness, good results. And when he look, when he's developing that environment, it's more indigenous, it's more circles, it's more about consistent with the tribal values. And so I'm hoping that um, we can spend some time um, uh, either complying with our own core values or ignoring them. And when I did not manage my reaction well, it's because I chose to ignore my own individual and tribal values in a reaction mode 
rather than in a responsive mode. Okay. More, Judge, um, uh, we have a comment from Judge Works. She says, Hi, Judge we have Works. Adopted, <laughs> she says, we have adopted a model at the Trinidad Rancheria Tribal Court where we assume for the sake of court matters that every perpetrator also is most likely a victim, and we proceed on that basis with consequences for infractions and general problem solving. This is our approach to trying to heal intergenerational trauma. Well, that I think is such a good point, um, you know, because I think that's where we find healing, um, and I'm really trying to, to work with some elders on this concept because um, when we're moving toward healing, there's got to be truth and forgiveness um, involved. And often the perpetrator has been a victim. So, you know, victim, the victim um, status has to be looked at from a broader perspective. Um, and I hope that um, uh, Judge Works, that it will help in terms of uh, healing that intergenerational trauma. And thank you for, for those, um, for, for sharing that. Uh, we have another comment from Chief Judge Drent. She says that maintaining empathy in the face of apathy is a constant struggle. Part of my management of this is to identify why a party might be apathetic, uh, parentheses, are they a victim, were they treated poorly in the system, what was their home life like? Um, employing that approach has been very helpful for me. Yes, um, I think that, that you hit the nail right on the head, maintaining empathy. Uh, because if we're not balanced ourselves as judges, we're starting to swing back and forth from anger to empathy to, uh, you know, trying to figure out what's really going on. Um, and I think a lot of our litigants, our, our people before the court, they're really doing fantastic considering their home life. You know, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, uh, your approach, um, we, we really need to share that with, with the rest of the judges because I think when I'm struggling with a case, to be able to talk to someone about, you know, what, what you're saying here, um, Ms. Brent, I, I think that that um, it helps me discern and and um, respond in a better way. Uh, Alicia Horn says, "I'm enjoying this webinar. I hope you have more webinars. I'd like to share with my team. I've worked in the justice system for ten years. I've learned to detox from my environment." It is hard, but it is a continuous self-awareness. I'm looking for training or programs to provide to justice team uh, to remind or to teach self-care. Um, you know, um, it's Alicia Horn, right? Um, I think that when Nigel first asked me to do this, and then I did it with my law class before, um, I think we can all do it. You just have to really, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the self-awareness um, because we're so easy to ignore that aspect of it. And that self-awareness with an openness is really important. And um, I, I find that if we do this in a circle, and I wish we had a big virtual circle here, that we're able to get to move toward a more healthier um, work environment. And I think that if we, we have a healthier work environment, 
we're going to have um, healthier individuals, and that's going to have the ripple effect. So I really appreciate your positivity in, in this because it's not an easy thing to talk about. I was so stressed preparing for it. And so thank you. You have one more comment, Judge uh, Fairbanks. Uh, Mary Jo Hunter, she says, Chief Judge Lowe and I, and they're with Ho-Chunk, um, have both taken the ACEs quiz to assess our own backgrounds for our work on our wellness courts. That made me aware of my own trauma that I'm bringing to the bench. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I know I'm so glad to see you on board. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from Ho-Chunk in terms of, of their, the way that they've um, incorporated their traditional court and their clan mothers. And, you know, it's in that tradition and culture, no matter where you're from, um, that you're going to find some peace. And, and it's just, again, getting that um, dealing with your own trauma, um, thank you, because that's kind of hard to deal with your own trauma. So thank you, Ms. Hunter. And Rebecca, it looks like that last comment is for you um, to think about adding something around this to the conference coming up. Absolutely. I just saw that. <laughs> thank you, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Helen. That's a good um, – and I see Judge Hager is on, and he's a mover and shaker with Nigel, so hopefully that will happen. He's um, on the board, so. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, Rebecca or Jessica, how are we doing on time? 40 minutes. 45 minutes, yeah, exactly. Oh, good. <laughs> Someone told me I didn't pay attention to the time, and I'm trying to be more conscientious about it. Um, any other comments from the um, – Participants, I really appreciate you, even though you have to type in. I think your comments are so good. And um, it, it's giving me more confidence that we need more of this, not just in the ju judiciary, but in general. I see a couple more people are typing. Let's give them a little a few minutes. I know that um, Lori Noble has said that she really appreciates that the judges are looking at the holistic view in the tribal court systems, and if 
all courts did this, it would create so much healing. I think, um, Ms. Noble, that's such a good point. Um, and if I were running this in a circle, I would really start with um, our core values and who gifted those core values to you because um, they're, that really sets a good foundation. And if we um, set that those as foundational principles, it really moves much smoother. I've tried it the other way, skipping it, and it doesn't work as well. So, um, and I love that you're focusing on healing, and, and um, that has been such a void in our court systems. And if we could move toward healing instead of blame and incarceration, I think that we're going to have stronger communities. Um, and I like what Miss. Rent said in terms of of um, being helpful to have colleagues to commiserate with. Um, one of the things that I noticed um, several years ago when we did this at NIJA, we did it at the end, kind of as an afterthought, and I was like hesitant about it. But you know what? After that, so many judges came up, and not just judges, but court personnel. Um, I remember this one judge saying, you know what, this helped me so much that um, she said she felt like she was failing and she felt like um, she was all by herself and she didn't want to share her insecurities with others. And she just didn't think it, this work was for her. And I was like, I've been there, I've done that. <laughs> and so... Um, I think that's what NIJA is about, is really getting our judges together so that we can not just share each other's expertise, but um, we can be professional colleagues in terms of supporting each other because this is hard work. I think the other thing oh. that Fairbanks is that it helps um, the judges, you guys, to go back and be you know, leaders in your own court systems, because with something like, like compassion fatigue, it's really important that the, the all of those other folks that are there really feel like the judge gets it, right? That you guys set that tone. Right. And so having having colleagues to commiserate with and then being able to carry that back to your own system is so vital. Good. Okay. Uh, and then someone gave us information on compassion fatigue. And I hope you can post that um, because all those things together really make a difference. And um, I'm hoping, um, Rebecca and um, Judge Hager, that maybe um, Nija can um, expand this so that we have um, more judges participating. When we did this last year, maybe, um, we had several judges from different jurisdictions um, sharing their story. And that was really effective, you know, because they were very truthful and, and they were very um, open in terms of recognizing and being self-aware and what they would do different, you know. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece. So um, let's move. Uh, Rebecca, did you have anything else to add, or Jessica? Uh, no, it doesn't look like we have anything else right at this moment. No. OK. So we'll move forward. And of course, the next slide talks about the vicarious trauma as well as the compassion fatigue. And um, I don't think as a judge that any of us really want to have a lessening of our compassion, but we also want to make sure that um, we're taking care of ourselves. So, um, so if we're not taking care of ourselves, um, because as the judge, everyone goes, oh, yeah, the judge is on today. The judge is here. Boom. You know, that sends a message. 
Um, and so what is the message that you're sending to your court and to your court personnel? And yes, recognizing that we have a lot of authority and power on the bench, um, but we really need to look at that environment so that it is an environment of justice, of fairness, of um, uh, healing. And um, if we don't take care of ourselves, our whole court, our whole environment, um, the morale starts dipping. And so, you know, especially tribal courts, I feel like we're under the microscope all the time, not just criticism from the states and feds, but also from our own constituency, the people we serve. And so pause and really take a look at your work environment and um, see how you can improve that. Also, there are situations where I call these energy drainers. And who, how are we participating in a professional response or a professional environment so we're not just surrounded by individuals who drain your energy, whether they're staff or clientele, or, you know, because as court people, personnel, we have to be so open, respectful, but yet we have to make sure that someone's not draining our energy right before we go on the bench. I remember working with the peacemakers and um, we were having a briefing and I could, I had missed my plane. I didn't miss it, but there was some kind of delay. And so by the time I got to the court, my anxiousness was going off on the peacemakers. And I had to just stop and say, Cheryl, you're, you've got to make sure when they go in that they're at peace and they're, um, uh, you're not draining their energy before they go in because they have to be so on. And, um, and I find that before I, I'm getting ready for oral argument. We have five cases. And I know before I go on, especially if I'm presiding, I don't want to be around anyone who's draining my energy, you know? So really take care of yourself so you're, you're doing your best when you get out on the bench or whatever you're facilitating because have healthy boundaries so people aren't bombarding you at the last minute with something that throws your balance off because that's going to really affect your demeanor and how the case is being run. And so um, if you don't do that, we really get into this inefficiency in terms of our, how our courts are run. And it, it results in system glitches that we're either going to participate in or we're going to make a difference. Um, and that's where, as a judge, as someone with decision-making authority and someone with the responsibility to, to make sure there's justice and fairness in your system, that you can address those glitches early on. Um, so coping strategies. So we ourselves, as the judiciary, really need to move towards healing and, and our way of life, as, as uh, I'll share with you um, with the core values piece. And it has to be something beyond dinners or golf and alcohol. And um, I think that the best thing is physical activity. I know that some of you probably know um, Justice Briscoe. Whenever he's the chief justice at um, Mississippi Bend, whenever at an IJ thing, um, 
we try to walk even if it's in the parking lot, you know, and we don't get to see each other that often, but we get up early and sometimes I don't want to do it. He goes, hey, we've made this, this commitment. Judge Romero, who's the president of National Council of Family and Juvenile Judges, when we did the child abuse and neglect training, um, bringing mainstream and tribal together, we walked every single morning, and I felt like that really made a difference in our, our um, effectiveness. Um, and so um, some kind of physical activity, I think, is important. Rest is very important and being an elder I've had to train myself to take a nap it is the craziest thing I, I'm just not a napping type of person but um, I'm trying to walk my talk and then the relaxation and of course the positive social contacts Rebecca and Jessica was there anything else that we needed to um, add here We did have um, from uh, the Colville tribe, um, they have a healing to wellness court and it deals a lot with holistic healing instead of punishment. And so this whole idea of extending um, the healing and um, compassion to the clients um, really is the center of that program. And it looks like lots of folks liked that whole idea of uh, holistic healing. And uh, I think it's a great, great way to uh, to carry these ideas forward. And then um, Judge Hager is talking about Steve Martin in the movie All of Me, which is a great movie. I now want to go home and watch it. Um, Lily Tomlin, she, he's talking to Lily Tomlin and says, you're an energy vampire. You suck all the fun out of being a lawyer. Um, and that's like a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judge. <laughs> and uh, Judge Hager, I'm glad you said that because um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of coping is laughter. You know, as judges, we don't laugh enough. And I have this one son, he loves to laugh. And to me, it just as a mother, of course, it makes me smile. But as I looked at, uh, I think I was preparing for this for another jurisdiction, and I really wanted to focus on the importance of laughter. And even the Mayo Clinic has weighed in on it. And it does build up your immunity. And sometimes I think watching a comedy is just the best self-care you could do. And, and so I think I feel like I need to go <laughs> watch that too. Because um, uh, you made a good point on energy vampires. And the way I think about that, Judge Hager, is, and, and how I've experienced it is, yeah, they come, and you want to be empathetic, I get it, you know, but you also want to have good boundaries in terms of they come, they see you, they're interacting with you, they leave smiling, and you're sitting there depressed and totally depleted. So you have to do something about that, but thank you for sharing that. And so, um, uh, I think the ABCs, um, and I like this because it was simple, um, and it's mainly to develop an awareness about it. And um, this is the most critical factor because we're working long hours, and, um, and then we're working when we get home. And then we go, oh, I'm going to just so relax over the weekend. Then we're sneaking in a few hours here and there. So take a look at your office and take a look at your car. And um, sometimes because we're so unaware of, of how we're participating in this toxic environment that we have no time for normalcy, no time for normal pursuits. Plus it um, ends up in poor physical health and issues with your family exacerbate. And, um, you know, I've had my family be very, very um, frank with me in terms of, um, hey, you know, calm down. We're your family. We love you. But 
we can't put up with your hypervigilance. <laughs> so the ABCs is important, awareness, and um, that's the first step. And then the balance and tribally, that's what they always say, the elders, balance, balance. And then the connection, connecting in with yourself, of course, and then staying away from those, uh, what were they called? Energy vampires. And so when I say we've been facing the wrong way, um, those of you who know I work in the peacemaking field, and I always say to the peacemakers or the tribe, sometimes we've been um, facing the wrong way. We've been looking to the outside for our answers, when in fact we have the answers internally, whether it's in the tribe or within our community or within ourselves, okay? And so you have the answer within yourself, but you just have to use those ABCs to get there. And so many of us judges find strength in our community and um, our culture, our faith, our colleagues, our families. And so now is the time to really think, what are my core values? What do I stand for? And I'm either going to comply with them or I'm not. And so... Um, so buffers, turn around and let's shift to our own core values. Um, I say tribal values, but it's just your own values. It's just what your parents taught you, your grandparents. Um, and so um, I find these to be um, fun. I, I kind of shared with you a healthy sense of humor. Respect, I think, is a universal law across all cultures. I learned mine from my grandmother, my Sesque, who uh, was Klingit and um, could not speak English. Um, but we all managed to communicate, and her main role was respect, and that's what she lived by. And that's how um, we were raised. And it's often good to get back into that circle. Um, being an active listener, um, in peacemaking, we often say it's more important to listen. And I think as judges, we know the importance of listening. And so um, kicking that up a notch in terms of, of really listening. And I think the main thing is listening to your own self, listening to your own body. Um, you know, because your body sometimes is screaming at you and you're not listening. And so pay attention. Getting adequate sleep. And then who are you surrounding yourself with in your sacred circle? And pay attention to that. I love, whenever I'm home in Alaska, everyone has hobbies, especially in the wintertime. And um, I don't, I call them hobbies because, a lot of it is art, a lot of it is craft, music, doing things that, that really serve to nurture yourself. And of course, vacations. I do not remember taking a vacation where I wasn't interrupted by the telephone or some kind of urgent matter. So if you're going on vacation, really go on a true vacation. I don't know, I'm lecturing to myself. Not to you all, but I feel like um, my family is so used to that that it's normal to them, and that's wrong. You know, that's sacred family time and sacred self-care time and sacred downtime, and to be interrupted continuously really is not good self-care. It really throws you out of balance, and so, of course, the healthy team environment with um, good supervision, fair supervision, and, and good support for each other. Um, and often as judges, you know, people don't realize we need support too. You know, um, we could be supportive, but we need the support. And these are our, our traditional um, tribal values from Southeast Alaska, and it's really our way of life, and I know Pokegon has done it, um, different Ho-Chunk has done it, Mississippi Band, I'm just, 
Alabama, Pechanga, all these different tribes have come up with their own um, uh, values. And um, we're starting at Ixbo Court in the second judicial here in New Mexico. And with the tribal, with the task force, I really went through a core values, and those are going to be the values for the court. So, so um, you know, like humor, hold each other up, listen well with respect, speak with care, you, you know, um, be strong and have courage. Um, so think about your own values. Um, and that's an important piece, especially what I love is in uh, Chief Judge he has the teachings of the seven grandfathers right there at his court, smack in the middle. Choctaw has their, their core values interpreted. Um, they have it in Choctaw, and then they have a couple elements interpreting what that means. And is it Black's Law Dictionary? No. Is it Webster's? No. But that's the tribal lens. And so develop an awareness, um, and we're going to comply, or should we just ignore? And I, 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 you know, I think there are many times when I just totally ignored it. Why? Because I wasn't balanced, I wasn't, you know, under a good self-care um, umbrella. And so um, judges must be alert to the compassion fatigue, establishing clear boundaries. I do barriers instead of boundaries, and I go, ah, here's the barrier, stay away from me. So we need to have clear boundaries that are healthy. And so um, acquiring um, good coping skills, and balancing the rigors of work. And I'm sure um, there's more there. Um, take stock. We have to realize that really this work is not for everyone. Um, and so maybe rotating into a less stressful calendar, that's being good to yourself. That doesn't mean you're a weak judge or in and capable or whatever, but be good to yourself. Take time off and sabbaticals. I know one of my sons, they give after X number of years, they give a two month sabbatical. And I'm like, holy God, if I could have two days or two weeks, I'd be thrilled. And so think about that. How can you make your system more healthy? And if it's more healthy, it's going to be more productive. So bringing awareness, bringing our oral tradition. And I love, uh, I'm sorry that people aren't being able to talk and we're having to type everything. But I really love the oral tradition because then you're hearing it and you're seeing the expression and you're feeling the deepness of it. And our language, our customs, and our tradition in a contemporary context. And um, of course, reassess being a judge, um, uh, attending to um, our physical and emotional health in a disciplined way, and, and holding ourselves personally accountable as well as holding others legally responsible. And there's a site right there on judicial well-being. And I love this because there's symmetry in that little basket. It's the old basket. We use it um, in our peacemaking circles. And um, I find that in that circle, in that symmetry, I have to stand in my own sacred circle. If I'm out of the circle, I'm working too hard. When I'm in the circle, things are happening in a beautiful way, and I'm able to accomplish much more. And so really understanding the power of that circle and the power of self-care as being aware of your own emotional, physical, spiritual health is an important ABC. 
So Senator, in the contemporary... I just wanted to chime in with, the, with the time check, Judge Fairbanks, that we have about 13 okay. minutes left. Okay, let's go. We're coming down the home stretch. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the comp contemporary, I love this because, you know, when the steward says, put on your own mask first, and, you know, we all kind of chuckle, but I think it has a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of advice there that's good because if you're not taking care of yourself, forget it. The rest isn't going to happen and you're not going to be able to um, uh, be effective. And so be focused. Make an agreement with yourself and take time to do it maybe after the um, session. I'm really a journal person and I find that that journal can become my own, my very best friend. And so when I make an agreement with myself to really be more balanced, be aware of my time constraints, it really helps my stress level go down and increases my freedom. And I do that through quietness and um, trying to really uh, be in a calm, um, harmonious environment and, and working on my own healing. And I really have to make an agreement with myself because uh, I can sway off of my own little um, uh, focus so fast. So make an agreement with yourself to really focus um, not just on self-care, extreme self-care. And so from the peacemakers, I learned so much from them in terms of the spirituality aspect and whatever that means to you. Um, and, and take time to reflect and renew and refresh and maybe redirect. And I've mentioned this many times, self-care, no, extreme self-care. And so um, we really have to be balanced to practice law and to be on the bench. And a lot of this is in our rules, but a lot of it um, is not interpreted um, uh, with the spirituality and the self-care, so we have to put that into it. And so use your unique style, your voice, and um, you know, move towards something that's more healing, something that's more authentic. I like indigenous because um, I, I was fortunate to grow up on an island surrounded by my people. And, you know, as much as you protest against that or rebel against it, in your elder years, you're kind of chuckling like, hmm. <laughs> anyway, so um, the rule of respect is, is important. And to be courteous and kind, and I borrow this bijaya um, from the Apache people when my husband was sick. Um, they sent that prayer in. And I love to share it on the bench, in our peace circle, as well as with um, people I work with. And it really means heal the heart and the rest will happen. So it's important to put the heart back into it. Um, music is an important piece. And all kinds of uh, visualizations. Put some good visualization into your um, office and surroundings, and I always tell the NIDA group, think Hawaii. And so make sure you remember it's safe for you to rest. And then here's some self-care, relax, wellness, energy, resilience, balance, health. And so shift happens. I always use that in peacemaking. Um, so you can shift to a much more balanced um, self-care um, lifestyle. 
Um, you can be the ripple effect, and I use this in peacemaking because sometimes it just takes one person to make the difference. And then that spillover ripple effect is phenomenal. And I, I do this in a way that is indigenous because this is the ripple effect of a resilient people, and that's our canoe coming in. My son is the second oar there, and I just think that there's so much to be happy for and so much to share, and often we see the worst on the bench, so we really have to um, be intentional and, and be healthier and take care of ourselves. Again, sovereignty begins at home, and um, remember to add peace. And um, I say Gunesh Chish, which is thank you and Klinga. It's a big thank you, and it's a Bijaya thank you. It's healing the heart, and Bijaya heals the heart, and the rest will happen. And so self-care, yes, but extreme self-care. And so um, the rest is about our conference, and um, I will put closure to this and just say thank you, and um, I wish you well, and I hope you will be the ripple effect within your own jurisdiction. Gunesh Chish. Are we supposed to have um, comments or questions? Uh, we do have a few I don't know our time. And, and questions. We have about seven minutes left. Um, I oh, just okay, want to cool. share with Good. you um, this uh, comment from Rena. She says, I truly believe those that you work with are family and from the, that strong foundation needs to be built because you depend on them and they depend on you. You share the majority of the time in your office. Um, this webinar makes a good tool, I think, for, for people to use is the point she's making there, too, that um, you guys can watch these with your teams um, and maybe talk about some, some self-care practices that can occur. Um, and so I think it's uh, really important to, to form um, those bonds within your program, um, within your courts. And uh, <laughs> we have... Uh, Judge Trent doing clapping sounds. So excellent. <laughs> I I wanted um, Jessica and Rebecca. I wanted to add a thank you to all the judges and and people on the call. When I saw some of your names, I was a bit intimidated, but thank you because I know you and I know that you all are doing the good work and will have that ripple effect. And um, I wish we were in person so I could acknowledge you, but good Chish for sticking with this um, uh, seminar. And, and uh, I wish I could acknowledge each one of you personally, but thank you so much. It, it really um, made a difference. And I, I think it was just such a great, rich discussion discussion today. How wonderful. Rebecca, are you on the line still? Did you I sure ready? am. Okay, good. Um, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming um, conference and uh, other good yeah. stuff happening at NIJA. Absolutely. So as you can see on your screen, we have our 2019 National Tribal Judicial and Court Personnel Conference coming up. This is a big one because we are NIJA at 50, reflecting on the past, building for our future. It's going to be at Mystic Lake in Shackleton, October 16th through the 18th. Conference registration is now open. And also, I wanted to mention that this webinar um, it has been recorded, and we will be sharing it both on the NIJA website and our NIJA Facebook page. So there's always an opportunity to share this information um, with two efforts. And as Jessica mentioned in chat, she will be sharing the PowerPoint slides with everyone who's registered for this webinar.
So save the date. Hope to see you all there. Uh, do you want to close out, Jessica, and I can do my comments? Sure. Um, so I, I just want to thank everyone for participating today. When we close